morning all, good morning, this is George. Uh, just want to check that the volume's okay. Um, I just did a short test, one or two people said that they uh, didn't actually hear anything. So do let me know if you can hear me and also see the chart. Excellent, thank you guys, Manoj, Rakesh, uh, panel Far, Pat, um, and really good to see you all in the room. Right, well, um, we're going to uh, look at a couple of um, uh, slightly diverse things this morning. We're going to look at some of the key issues. Now, I've uh, done this presentation quite a few times um, over the last year, where we just looked at some of the sort of key issues that there are, and uh, they would range from what was going on with Ben Bernanke and, uh, of course, the dear old uh, QE, and what the recovery prospects are like and uh, range of things like gold. And then moving on to the charts. Now, we're going to do a little bit of that, but um, in a slightly different format this morning. But we will, of course, also get on to uh, looking at uh, specific um, trading matters and uh, particularly trading extremes, which is something that I do like to do uh, whenever I can. And um, really just sort of interpreting, interpreting what is going on with uh, with charts, as traders become ever more sophisticated, as the large funds um, are um, to a uh, very great extent working against the interests of um, maybe the smaller guys, then it becomes increasingly important to trying to find an edge and uh, try and sort of maintain that edge over a period of time. Now, in the world of trading, of course, um, markets are dynamic. Um, and uh, the very participants will always be looking to maintain that edge. And our, our job is to possibly keep on doing much of the same old, same old, but being aware of what these changes are and um, uh, making sure that we can actually move to those times. So enough of the uh, preamble, enough of the preamble. I've just gone back from a reasonably long trip, um, which took me to Hong Kong. And um, it took me to New Zealand and a little bit of time in San Francisco as well. But main bulk of the time was um, over there in, in New Zealand, <clears throat> country I haven't been to before, but um, city so spent a bit of time in Australia, and it was really quite uh, quite quite an interesting country and an eye opener for me. But uh, prior to that, uh, spent uh, quite a few days in Hong Kong, meeting a few customers and meeting some very serious traders, one or two hedge fund managers and what have you. And it's a really fascinating experience uh, over there. It um, gave my sort of first trip to Hong Kong. Um, and um, what really struck me um, about it was sort of several things. Number one, the amount of absolutely staggeringly massive wealth that there is. Um, in a relatively small number of hands and um, really su supporting all of that. Then we've got um, a whole army of expats uh, living and working out there. Um, a great number of them in the financial services industry in general. And um, of course, there's always the contrast to the, uh, the average sort of poor Chinese um, whose wealth is tied up in his bicycle and um, what he's got carrying on his handlebars. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. in fact, I, I, um, I provide a great amusement to um, taxi drivers with my uh, attempted um, my, 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 my attempted Mandarin, and um, they would sort of chuckle considerably at, uh, at my sort of garbled attempt to at, uh, tell him where I actually needed to go. However, um, that's um, that, 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 that's that. Yeah, you know, there are a good many trading clubs. There are a good many um, of the, um, certainly the sort of companies that we, we know extremely well. Um, the, the main brokerages, of course, uh, are out there and uh, a good many of the, um, of, of the trading schools. And um, I was invited to speak to, uh, with, with a, a small group and um, that was by one of the brokers. And uh, I was very pleased to actually meet uh, a, a, a whole variety of people. But um, many of them very, very serious traders indeed. And um, it, it's tra trading. Well, um, I put out little notes um, yesterday saying that trading is really in the DNA of 
um, of um, those in the Far East. And of course, Hong Kong is um, and has been historically one of the major trading nations in, uh, in, in all sorts of things over the, uh, uh, over the millennia. And um, it, it's uh, just all part and parcel of, uh, of what they do now. Always looking for opportunities, and those opportunities seem to abound. And since, um, in fact, I have a cousin who lives out there. He's lived out there since the 1970s. And um, the transition that he's seen um, is certainly from the changeover from British rule to uh, Chinese has not actually been that great. The Chinese have... Um, very, very carefully maintained its um, its entrepreneurial spirit, which um, there were sort of great uh, concerns that that would actually die along the way. However, all of that said, let's just um, let's just consider one or two things that um, just occurred or occurring to me recently. And first of all, what I want to do is to just take a, a little glance. First of all, at one other key issues. And that is what's going on with this dollar index. Now the dollar, the dollar, our world currency, and this is the one that um, everyone wants to price everything in and uh, set their own currencies against, and uh, we're always looking at it. It is stuck in the middle. Where is it going? Where is it going? And if anyone's got the crystal ball with the definitive answer, please let us know right now. Because it is not clear. It is not clear. But one thing that does occur to me is that if we run this chart out just um, a little further, what has not happened yet is the great dollar collapse. Now, um, we've had many, many commentators talking, um, certainly over the sort of the Christmas New Year period, which is the time of prediction, telling us that the dollar is going to stronger. That appeared to be the general consensus. However, however, there is still, <laughs> yeah, the euro collapsed. Well, that hasn't happened either. That hasn't happened either. So, um, in the prediction business, um, it, it's well, it's littered with um, wrong predictions. And so you've got to be exceedingly careful to. <laughs> We've got to be so, so careful not to allow ourselves to drop into the prediction business too deeply and really, really believe in a prediction. Because when we do that, then it becomes part of us and we then start to find everything which will justify our point of view. And that can be exceedingly dangerous. Because once uh, the markets get a whiff of the fact that we feel that it's going to go one way, what does it do? It darn well goes the other. So um, what I just really want to point out is that we've got a little line. And there we are, I've got a yellow line on this weekly chart of the dollar index. It is vulnerable to a sell-off. So since the, um, since the start of the year, well, we're not that many weeks into the year. But what we've had is an attempt to move higher, an attempt to move lower, an attempt to move higher, and an attempt to move lower, meaning that it's just going nowhere, stuck in a trading range. And that trading range now is developing into, and has developed into, this quite interesting little wedge. Now, technical analysis tells us that when you've got a wedge or a triangle, then the breakout is going to be on the flat side, suggesting that it's going to break on the upside. Now, that may well happen, but, of course, we are very, very vulnerable to this move that could run price right the way down here to where it was back in 2011, considerably lower. Now, that could happen. It could happen. So, it's probably quite a good idea to have um, alternatives tucked away in our pocket, we can actually sort of pick out and uh, and just sort of use from time to time. Now, if we run out to the monthly chart, we've got a somewhat different perspective. The monthly chart, then, is showing that we're in a very, very strong support band, and that support band just might be enough to 
I'll pass on up. And break that triangle in the direction that um, basic technical analysis tells us that it should break. Now, we now put yet another line in down below, picking out the 2008 and the 2011 low, then we've still got that possibility that there could be a big sell-off. And, uh, of course, you know, the eagle-eyed amongst commentators are looking at this and saying, huh, well, that's a head and shoulders. That's a head and shoulders. It is going to break. It is going to break big time. So we may well find that happening, but the key thing at the moment is that it is going nowhere. It has not yet shown its true colours. It has not shown us which way it is definitely going to go. But within this band, there will, of course, be all sorts of um, all sorts of opportunities to put in some trades based on what it does in the short term. So back to the daily chart, um, and what we're looking for then are areas of support, and we've got a white line running across here that just might just might be an area of support. Um, to come in. It's found an area of resistance. Resistance is so often at previous highs, and that's exactly what it's found. Look at that. We've got several tests of this region. Several tests of this region. One, two, three, four, you know, particularly, as we can see quite recently, um, the dear old dollars failed to get above there. At the moment, it's trying to find some support. It may well do that. And if you can break up above here, then that scenario of the breakout on the flat side of the wedge could well come through. Now, yeah, absolutely right, Pam. It's um, tapering talk, tapering, tapering, tapering. What is going on with tapering? Well, now, that actually brings us to the changeover that we've had with Janet Yellen, Right now, bear with me for a second. With Janet Yellen taking the chair from um, from Ben, Ben Bernanke then has um, has bowed out, and um, he engaged in a little bit of tapering. As we know, back in uh, when was it June last year or, or thereabouts, he bottled it. He bottled it. He was going to taper, and he didn't taper, and then eventually he did taper. He did taper. So, what does tapering mean? Well, quite simply, tapering means that the amount of money printing being pushed into the economy is going to uh, be reduced. And a lot of commentators have said, right, OK, well, as soon as that happens, then we're going to see interest rates rise and we're going to see bonds absolutely collapse. So what we're looking at at the moment, we're just looking at the yield, not the actual bond itself, but the yield, like the interest rate which is paid on the 10-year. And this is the standard chart which we've looked at. There was a number, in fact, the last time I did this presentation, we were looking at this number of 3%. And that was a really important one because going from the lows, going from the lows, interest rates had doubled. Okay? And they doubled in less than a year. So we get interest rates going on up. And then we get the tapering, which is now in place. And what has actually happened? Well, we found that the markets have relaxed. They've relaxed right back. And we can tell that they've relaxed because interest rates have dropped back down. So we're in a trading range now with interest rates between, as you can see, three and two and a half percent. So that's Another sort of indication that we're sort of stuck in the middle with nothing really determinate going on yet, yet, yet. And that 3% barrier, it is said that if rates do actually go above there, then we're going to be in big trouble. We're going to be in big, big trouble because bonds will collapse, the stock market won't like it, and, and we will find that the dear old consumer, the dear old middle class house buyer with a mortgage on both sides of the Atlantic are going to find it a really, really tough time. Well, they're finding it a tough time right now. 
And um, you don't have to um, really sort of consider things very, very far. But <laughs> what's happening to the middle class? Well, the middle class, I suppose that, you know, a good many of us just on this webinar right, right now, we're, we're sort of um, middle class people. And um, effectively, what we've seen is the decline of the middle, middle class. And particularly this chart is showing the American um, middle class. So if we look at this little blue chart going back to, well, 1967, a long time ago, and um, what we've actually seen is that the aggregate income, okay, has been declining for the middle class. And that decline is really starting to, <laughs> get a proof in that one as well. Um, and yeah. So their income has been declining, or, you know, I've put myself in that category. Our income has been declining. But the top 20%, top 20%, just look at it, they have been picking up the slack, and they have had their income rising, rising, rising. And again, that is starting to accelerate even more. And as we go further into this world of, quantitative easing of money printing, what we found is that we have now got then this sort of group of people who are effectively responsible for the majority of consumption because they have got the money. And it's said now that the top 5% of, of earners actually are providing 38% consumption, and that's up quite considerably on a decade ago. So the figures are there, and also we're now finding that U.S. retailers are abandoning their middle-class offerings. So you're getting the likes of um, the, the lower and the middle echelon of U.S. retailers who are really abandoning their position. They're finding that it's unprofitable to sell to the average middle class. And where are they picking up the slack? Well, they are moving up market in a big, big way. The barnes of this world are really picking up the business. And um, that's a trend that's just been moving for a considerable period of time. And as mentioned, with the increase in the amount of money printing that there is, which is boosting asset prices, which helps the top 5%, it helps the those who are owners of uh, large amounts of um, stock, those who are investing in all sorts of things, commodities, etc., have done exceedingly well. So that's something then that uh, QE has accelerated the process of, and it will probably continue. But let's just now consider that there are one or two little problems on the horizon. And where they come from will be what is going on with interest rates and some of the other world currencies apart from the likes of the euro, the dollar, British pound, etc., what about emerging markets? Well, emerging markets are struggling. They are struggling with the prospect of QE actually tapering off, which is a way of tightening credit, tightening interest rates. And what is happening in so many emerging markets is that their currencies are collapsing as a result. And one real standout on this little chart is Turkey. Just look at Turkey. Now, Turkey has got all sorts of structural problems. I mean, internally, it's in political turmoil. Not quite sure if it's part of the Middle East or indeed if it's part of Europe. They've got all sorts of difficulties politically, um, socially, um, with their sort of political sociality, if you like. So sociology. And one of the 
difficulties that they are really, really facing is that they've got a massive inflation. And that massive inflation has actually resulted with a degree of tapering fear coming in that their currency is collapsing and an attempt to keep it up. What have they done? They've moved their interest rate from, look at that, 4.5 up to 10%. And they did that just over a week ago. So they've got big, big problems. The same applies to, not quite the same extent, but it applies to Brazil. Brazil, they had an absolutely booming economy. And a little bit of whistle tapering, etc. And that's caused them all sorts of problems. So money is flooding out of Brazil. They're having to keep their interest rates high. They pop theirs up by another half percent. And in an attempt just to try to hold back and stem the tide of money that are coming out of their country. And um, let's also look at India, which is also feeling the pinch, feeling the squeeze, feeling the draft of tapering. And their interest rates are also going up. And look at that again. Look at the date. It's a very recent hike that they've actually had put in. So... Whilst um, QE, <laughs> there's always it, things that, there's always a sort of a double edge to them. Whilst QE was um, something that managed to keep the global banking system intact, it also had the effect, as we know, of boosting emerging markets. But the moment that the Fed and the rest of our sort of world central banks get together and try to start to do something which is to get things back on an even keel again, there are always going to be fatalities along the way. And regrettably, those emerging markets are now taking the heat. They are suffering big time. So I, now I don't actually trade um, things like the um, Tokyo, et cetera. And, uh, but there are some amazing opportunities to be had. Um, we've got the South African Rand, which is uh, jumping around. In fact, they're, they're suffering in, in much, much the same way. And um, of, of those uh, emerging market currencies, the, uh, the, the, the Rand uh, I am told is a particularly good one to trade, although I don't think you trade it. So, so there we are. We've got, um, we've got a lot of heat coming in then on the, this attempt at, um, tapering and what I suspect what I suspect is that once the cockney of concerns coming through on emerging markets suffering really quite badly once that starts to really come through and, uh, and uh, the Fed actually sits up and takes notice, then I reckon that um, we will find that um, tapering will just stop and more clearly will come through. So there we are. That's just a a, a wild assumption that um, the addiction that there is to tapering, and my goodness me, um, I I really um, are very concerned about the, the, the whole process of continued QE. Because I, I'm very much um, an, an old action type of um, um, person economically. I, I always sort of have operated on the basis that banks and money should be made available to businesses, and that money should be invested at a sensible rate of return. And that rate of return is then ploughed back into the economy, and the manufacturers of those goods and services will actually employ people. They will have a market for their products that they sell. And the people who actually buy those products find those products useful. And the people who provided the capital will get a reasonable rate of return. However, we found that um, on both sides of the, the Atlantic, they got carried away with using money for money's sake. And 
one of the most damaging aspects of what has actually gone on over the years is putting a tremendous amount of money into houses which are non-productive assets. And so you know, they just effectively mopped up investment money which is available and they've just been chasing illusory returns because you buy a house and there is really no return on it. You know, it doesn't actually produce anything. There are no products coming out of it. And all you're, you're hoping for is that there's going to be a bigger fool who's going to pay more for it than you do and you'll make money out of it. And that is self-evidently something that doesn't really work. Contrast that with um, what very often goes on in Germany. And there was a very interesting article I was, I was reading um, over the weekend about a guy who um, went to buy a, uh, an apartment in Germany. And um, he saw the price. He made an offer. It was, a, it was agreed. Lo and behold, lo and behold, the um, sorry, short break now. Yeah, lo and behold, the authorities came along and said to the seller, "Your house is too expensive. You will need to reduce the price, or we will not allow you to sell it." <laughs> and reduce the price, he had to. He had to. And so there we go. That was quite an interesting little, um, because um, whilst there has been a degree of modest house price inflation over the decade, house prices in Germany have not taken part in this silly game that um, has been played. Right, okay, so much then for, for that. Now, there's one other little area that I want to just mention, and um, this really came about on my visit to New Zealand. And um, it's this. I've got a little chart here. It's just come from Wikipedia. So it's not very large. But um, it comes from really just looking at water. <laughs> now, I'm based in the UK. A place called Berkshire, where we have got the River Thames. The River Thames is overflowing because we have had, getting off a couple of months of um, endless rainfall, absolutely endless rainfall, um, quite unprecedented the amount of saturation of the land. Now, in contrast, having spent just a wee bit of time in uh, San Francisco, it actually rained just on the day that I was leaving, but prior to that, they'd had a major drought. A major, major drought. And what we found is that there is, in these areas of red or deep orange, there is a major water scarcity. And that major water scarcity, if you, if you just look at this, it pulls that band, that equatorial band, and what we're seeing is that there are great areas of certainly the Middle East, Northern Africa, parts of the US, and certainly large swathes of Asia, where water shortages are getting greater and greater and greater. And it would appear that with global warming, or believe it or believe it not, then what we've actually got is a lot of water falling in the extremes, particularly in the northern hemisphere, and to a lesser extent in the southern hemisphere. And those mid-bands, we have got all sorts and sorts of problems there with maintaining water where it's actually needed. And another little chart, just puts this to another degree of perspective, relating the percentage of global population, that's the little grey mark, with the amount of available freshwater resources. And what we find is that in areas, and Asia is the prime example of this, is that 
We've got 60% of the global population, but only 36% of available fresh water resources. So that's going to cause all sorts of problems, and over a period of time, this situation is being exacerbated. And so there will be a mad chase for any form of water resource that can be obtained. Now, you know, that's all very well, but if you consider the Middle East, which is something of a tinderbox politically, then we may well find that it won't just be social politics which is causing all sorts of problems. It may well be the most important physical resource that we all have, and water which will cause all sorts of further unrest. Now, I might just add, actually, that New Zealand has uh, got quite a lot of water. In actual fact, they've got a tremendous amount of irrigation done, um, quite simply because they have very, very good farmland, and that farmland is very, very good at supporting cattle, particularly cattle now, and to a lesser extent, sheep. You know, if you uh, associate New Zealand with lamb, uh, but now it's cattle, they have enormous herds, and what do they do with those herds? Well, they milk them like crazy, and um, they even now have technology where they can have a thousand strong herd, which will actually milk itself. I didn't believe it until I saw it. And what they're supplying is the worldwide demand, and particularly Chinese demand for milk powder. Right, okay guys, let's um, mention some of those uh, main issues. Let's go look at some charts. And let's move on from this dollar index chart, this sort of go nowhere chart that um, would appear to be somewhat stuck in the middle. Now let's just consider what is going on with one or two of these key ones. And the first key one I'm going to look at here is the stock market. Now, you know, stock markets, forex markets, there are always correlations and there are always alternative markets for us to be trade. But what I want to point out is that we have this major move on up and then the turn of the year is so often when we do get some major, major, major changes. And we've got it with this triple and quadruple top. Price then has just collapsed down in the first month or so of the year. And we've seen it move down in a very interesting little A, B, C move. And A, B, C moves are very useful because they tend to go through this sort of process in a correction. Well, at the moment, that's all it is. It's just a correction against this major uptrend. And these A, B, C moves with a little consolidation or lag in the middle will very often give an opportunity to trade the C move from the flag. But then, once everyone is very, very, very bearish indeed, because it's moved on down a considerable amount and everyone's getting panicky, at the end of the C move, you very often get the best opportunity to buy that there is. And sure enough, that's exactly what did come through and I came through last week, from this area of a previous low and an extension below another previous low. So where is it going to go from here? At the moment, we can see that it's just bouncing on up. We've not had an appreciable correction, but frequently what we look for is an ABC-type correction, so we just might get some correction coming on back against this trend before it does decide to, to move on higher. And I suspect that there will need to be some resolution of QE tapering before it's going to make new highs. And if we find that tapering actually gets suspended in some shape or form, then we could well see the stock market move to a new high. Right, so much then for that one. Let's just um, also consider gold, which old traditionally it's a 
measure of inflation. And what we're looking for is gold then to move on up when there are high inflationary expectations. Well, we haven't really got those yet. We haven't really got them. Now, when we go along to the supermarket and buy our sort of shopping or buy our fuel or all sorts of things, then, yeah, at this sort of level, we, we've got inflation. But what we haven't got is any strong, any really, really strong global recovery going on. By whatever measure you look at, then any sort of growth at the moment is really quite illusory. And consequently, I suspect that gold is still going to struggle to start to really, really take off. And so maybe we are still stuck in the middle with gold and it's going to be some little while before it really, really does get moving. At some point, it will do so. At some point. But I don't think we're anywhere near yet. Now, I just want to come back to another little chart, which is a correlation chart. It brings in a currency. It brings in a very important currency, and that is the US dollar against the Japanese yen. Now, as we all know, the Japanese have uh, decided that they want a very, very weak US, um, very weak Japanese yen, and consequently, the US dollar has risen strongly against it. But what has actually happened is that we saw towards the end of the year that looking at the commitment of traders reports, there were far too many longs in the market, in the market. Far too many longs of the US dollar against the Japanese yen, which translates into far too many shorts on the yen. And consequently, we've got this something of a sell-off. Now, at some point, it's going to turn the corner. It may have turned the corner already, but we're still stuck in this downward move with the yen doing exactly the opposite of what the Japanese want. At some point, Japanese holidays, I believe, is a problem. At some point, we're going to find that we'll get a very useful little high or low. We haven't got it yet. And um, when that one comes in, at a level of potential support, if we look back, we've got potential support, more or less, where prices actually come to at the moment. And just on the basis of this little pattern, which is working its way through into an A, B, C, D, E, then we could well be ready for takeoff. But it needs probably to drop back another hundred or so pips before we're going to see it. Now, what about the correlation? Well, the correlation is with the U.S. stock market. Just look at the correlation. One moves up, the other moves up. And so you cannot separate these two out. They move in lockstep. They move in lockstep. So whenever you're looking at the stock market, also look at the U.S. dollar against Japanese yen. One will tell us where the other one is most likely to go. Right. Now, let's just come down to look at one or two very tradable charts. And we'll start off with the euro. And the euro is something that has been really going quite nicely. I'm going to look at one or two extremes. And what constitutes an extreme? And what can actually help us put a trade there? Now, I trade both intraday and somewhat longer term. <clears throat> and it's the intraday movements, which I'm probably most interested in, but let's start off with what's been going on with, on the daily chart. What we can see is that last week, from an extreme, price had been moving down, and it then eventually put in a series of narrow range candles, which were then completely engulfed on the upside. So you get this really good day last, um, last week, on Thursday, when it just showed us that it was not going to go any lower, certainly not for now. 
and the harmonic software that's actually supposed to pick up that area. It was the bottom. So it's moved from 135. It's attempting to move on up now above 137, although it's got a very little way to go to actually manage that. And what's going to be really quite interesting is will it or will it not manage to break its previous part? Now, definition of a trend, certainly on the downtrend, is a succession of lower highs and lower lows. Well, we've got that. This could be just an area where it's going to cave in. It might want to get up to 137 and then cave in. So we've got to be pretty cautious at the moment to pull this considerably higher. But if it can get itself above that white line, and then put in a nice little corrective move, we could find that the euro is going to confound all the critics and go strongly higher up towards the, the 140 level is entirely possible. Now the four hour chart is actually telling us that what we've seen so far and we've seen it for a hit yesterday and again today is this hit the Gartley level. So we've got a potential Gartley and Gartley patterns when they work are very, very powerful and it could it just could be enough to go and push this down for a major correction right the way back to where it actually started from. But the key level needs to push above that high, okay, that was formed towards the end of the, towards the end of January. Now let's just come right the way down to short term trading and the 15 minute and the 5 minute chart are really quite useful for that. Now, when I'm trading at extremes, what I'm looking for, I'm looking for corrections. We got a correction that came in and it came in open So we're going to move down. And that move down came after a pretty dramatic run up that happened just after, uh, just after midnight UK. And what I look for, the ABC type price. We can get an ABC, the, a, a, an ABC correction of an A and a B and a C. In the context of an uptrend, and it can come down to a level, in this case, it's down to a 50% level, and then it shows evidence that it's going to move on up. And we certainly got that in spades here. And I use these different colours to tell me where the balance of volume is, where the big activity is. And what we find is that we've got a candle there that's telling us that we're going to move on down, but there was no follow through. The next two candles told me that he could get position long, and so it's a question of just taking that long for that little short term 20 pip move on the upside. So there we go. That's trading at an extreme, and uh, the extreme trader software is uh, just about to become available. Right, guys. I think I've um, now reached the two minute. Yeah, no, I think I've reached the time limit. I've just been told by FX Street that um, I need to bring this to a close at this point, which I will. So you've got a little flavour there of um, the screen trailer, which is just about to be public. But also, I hope I've probably given you one or two things to have a little ponder on, and um, particularly keep looking at some of those correlations, and um, try not to form too many strong predictions or opinions. On gold, well, as I just mentioned earlier, then I actually think that we're a bit stuck in the middle. 
I don't yet see anything moving strongly. Kiwi in the uh, long term, a strong currency, and it will remain strong, I'm absolutely sure. Okay, guys, well, thanks for being uh, with me this morning, and uh, as ever, I've thoroughly enjoyed you, and uh, hope to see you again next month.